Hi everyone, welcome. This is Dale Anderson again. We just want to keep going in our course on biblical doctrines of our faith. And last time we talked about the different offices that Jesus is walking in right now. We talked about the fivefold ministry and his ministry as prophet, priest, and king. Today we want to come back to some of his present day ministry and kind of drill down just a little bit more and look at the scriptures you know, just to see what, what is the actual ministry Jesus is performing from the right hand of the Father. I mean, so often it's through the power of the Holy Spirit, through his prayer, and, and, and so we just want to look at, so how does this actually work? So let's begin. We know that according to Scripture from Acts chapter 1 and from Ephesians, the disciples experienced it, and Paul talked to us about it, that Jesus was raised from the dead, and that he ascended into heaven. The, uh, the disciples at that time watched him from the Mount of Olives go up into the sky and be caught up by a cloud and taken up into the heavens. And the angels spoke to them and telling them, you know, basically I'm paraphrasing their words, why do you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus who you saw taken up will come again. Now it's time to go to Jerusalem and pray like he told you to do. And Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1 in that great apostolic prayer that one of the things that we pray for is for the power of God to rest on our lives and to rest on the church. And he compares, he says, that mighty power is like the power God used when he raised his son from the dead and seated him in the heavenly realms at his right hand. And so we know that as Jesus ascended into heaven, he sits in his session right now, from the moment he was taken up into heaven, ascended into heaven, until this moment, until he returns, but at this moment he sits at the right hand of the Father, and so what's he doing? I mean, is he just sitting there? Is he eating grapes like some commercials like to show you? Is he just floating around? Or we know that the angels in Acts 1 told us this same Jesus, Jesus was in a glorified body, it was a real body, It had flesh and bone, but it was glorified, right? So so we know he's in a natural body. This same Jesus is sitting on a throne next to the Father in a glorified human body that will never experience death, that has glory in it that you and I haven't actually fully seen. And so as he sits there, what is he actually doing? First of all, it tells us that he's praying for his people. He's praying for his church. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, it says this, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He is interceding for you and I, that we walk in our destiny, that we're strengthened with power and might, that we understand who he is. In other words, we're given a spirit of revelation, that as we read the word of God that ministers to our lives and shapes us and molds us and transforms us and conforms us into his image. I like to think of it this way. So many of the prayers of the Bible is what Jesus is praying for you and I. It's why I like especially, you know, to fix my prayer life basically on the prayers and the promises of the Bible, because I believe that's actually the prayer language that Jesus is using as he sits at the right hand of his Father. He's praying for us. And he prays for us intensely. And my friends, it's really critical that we understand his ministry of intercession. The challenge that we have is that, well, if he's praying, why do we have such, with such trouble on the earth? And it's because when Jesus prays, Jesus prays from the scripture. And when we look at the scripture and we look at the prayers of the Bible, these promises are focused on God. They're promises to men and women, but they never detract from the nature of who God is, right? So that they seek to reveal God to us. And watch this point, watch this point. They never rob from us in our prayers. They never rob from us our free will choice. They direct our free will choice. They encourage it. They inspire it. But in the end, what we choose as an act of our free will, God is not going to violate that. He wants to have a relationship where you have, from your own free will, chosen to be with Him. From your own free will, chosen to love Him. From your own free will, chosen to walk with Him and to seek to change your life for the sake of love. And so we need to understand, my friends, that as Jesus sits in intercession at the right hand of the Father, he's praying the word of God to God. (laughs) 
God the Son is praying to God the Father through the Word of God, and He's revealing to us who God is. He sent the Holy Spirit to us, but my friends, let's really, really be clear. None of those prayers violate our free will. That is the power of the grace of God that has been sent to us. We have a free will to choose. And so it's, it reminds me of the story where G, before Jesus ascended, Jesus was trying to prepare the disciples for a moment of crisis called the cross. He knew he was about to die, and it was about a week before he was crucified. Jesus came to Peter and told him to prepare his life through intercession. And he called Peter to a life of prayer. He says, time for you to actually lock in and pray. And Peter said, Lord, I'm gonna, if I have to die with you, I'm going to die with you. And, and Jesus says to Peter, Peter, I know you're, you're willing, your, your heart desires this, but you are weak on the inside and you are not connected to how weak you are. You really aren't seeing it. And so Jesus speaks these words when we find the story in Luke 22, verses 31 and 32. He says, Simon, Simon. Oh, my friends, this is so intense. Simon, indeed, Satan has asked me. He's desiring to sift your life. And he wants to sift you as wheat. And watch what Jesus says. He said, but I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And when you return to me, remember to strengthen your brethren. Peter, I'm telling you right now, Satan is coming to sift your life. This crisis, this trouble that we're going to face in a minute called the cross, you're not going to relate to it well. And I just want you to know that Satan is going to use this time to try and draw you away from me and to break everything that I've put into your life. But I've prayed for you that your faith would not fail. My friends, one of the things that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father praying for you and I is as crises hit our lives as troubles touch us, as pressures come against us, that our faith would not fail. And that we would, even in a moment of instability where we're shaken and we're going, oh my gosh, whatever that's about, and and we start to wander and waver, he's still saying, come back to me, come back to me. I'm, I'm strengthening you with my prayers. He wants us to know that not in his heart that our faith would fail, But ultimately, he knows that we have our own free will. Peter actually walked away. You know, he he said, I'm going back fishing. And Jesus restored him after his resurrection and said, Peter, come on. He says, do you love me? He says, yes, Lord. I mean, it was such an intense moment for Peter. And that's where Jesus went and won him back and said, see, it's in your heart to follow me. It's just your flesh is weak. And you don't believe me that your flesh is weak. He said, you just... You need to understand that this life that I've called you to, right, is it's going to be crisis and and glory and one moment a challenge, the next moment powerful, and 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 you need to understand how to walk out this life that your faith would not fail. This is going to be a lifestyle, Peter, of of ups and downs, and but God is with you, and 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 I've prayed for you that you won't fail. Don't worry, Peter. It's going to be okay. So Jesus, right now. My friends, he is at the right hand of the Father praying for you and I that our faith would not fail, that we touch our destiny, that our free will would be inspired by his love. He's praying the promises and the prayers of the Bible. The next thing he said that he was doing is he told his disciples the night before he was crucified that he was going away to prepare a place for you and I, that where he is, we could be with him, we could be with him also. And he told that to his disciples in that great moments of time. You know, if you see the story in John, about John 13 to John 16, where he talks to them to prepare them for the crisis the next day is going to be. And he tells them in John 14, verse 3, he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many rooms or or many mansions. And so finally, we, you know, he got into a discussion with Thomas. Thomas says, well, well, show us the Father, you know, and and why can't we go with you? And, and Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And you can't go with me right now, but I will come. I won't leave you as orphans. I will come that you would be with me where I am. And then, you know, so many, many years later, as John the Apostle was visited by the Lord with the content of the book of Revelation, we see John write down this glorious vision that he has 
we mostly see that content in Revelation 21 and 22, where we actually see the New Jerusalem. He calls it the New Jerusalem. And he gives it two metaphors. You know, he gives it the metaphor of a bride having come down and prepared herself for her husband. And the other picture that he gives is he actually describes it as a house. He describes it as this this city, this place that is glorious, that has been hidden in the spiritual realms, but exists nonetheless. My friends, wherever you're at listening to me right now, whatever room in your house, or maybe you're at a coffee shop, or wherever you could be listening to my words right now, I just want you to see, you can't, I just want you to know, you can't see it. It's hidden in the spiritual realms, but existing right now, the reality and the truth of this place that Jesus has prepared for you and I, it exists today. The new Jerusalem is real. It's built. It's prepared for you and I. And my friends, I want you to know that that place exists. And so as you read through Revelation 21 and 22, you and I can have hope that Jesus has prepared this glorious place for you and I to reside with him. And this is the place he was talking about when he spoke to his disciples in John 14, the night before the cross. Just before we go to the next thing we want to talk about, I want us to understand one of the most powerful segments of the scriptures that you can read in a moment of crisis is the segments of Revelation 21 and 22 about the New Jerusalem. It will inspire you with such hope. It will cause you to glance upon the glories of what God has prepared for you and I. And you might say, well, how will that help me in a moment of crisis? It will shift the atmosphere of your heart. It will give you hope for the midst of the crisis that the reality of your eternal condition is far more weighty and more powerful than this momentary condition we have on this earth. My friends, the new Jerusalem will inspire you, and it is the place that Jesus has prepared for you and I. Well, let's move on. The next thing he said that he would do, and I believe he's still doing it, from the moment he sent Holy Spirit, which is one of the things that he would, he said he would send the Spirit so that we would no longer be orphans, that that Holy Spirit will not just be with us, in other words, surrounding us, right? But will be in us, indwelling us. So at the moment of your salvation, when you said yes to Jesus and repented of your sins and took the blood and applied it to your life to wash you and cleanse you, Jesus sent into your heart, into your spirit, the Holy Spirit to live there that you would have a witness that you are a son or a daughter of God. This is the primary purpose of the Holy Spirit. There's many things that he does, but the primary purpose of Holy Spirit is to give you an internal witness that you belong to your Father in heaven and are a brother to the Lord Jesus. He gives every believer, he gives them the Holy Spirit. Well, the other thing that he said he would do is he would build his church. Matthew 16 When Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? He asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they gave him answers, and then he he turned it on them. He said, who do you say that I am? And Peter kind of spoke up for everybody, and he said it with such conviction. He said, you are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. You are Messiah, the one sent by God, and you are God's Son. And Jesus affirmed Peter, and he said, Peter... Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. It's it's come by a revelation of my Father in heaven. And I just want you to know that on this, on the foundation of your confession, what you've just spoken, he says, your name is Peter, which means rock. But he wasn't talking about building his church on Peter. He was talking about building his church on the revelation that Peter had, that Jesus is the Christ, he's the Messiah, and he's the Son of the living God. And he said, and I will build my church on this revelatory understanding that you have, that I'm the Christ, I'm God's son, I'm going to build my church on that truth. And it doesn't matter what the, what the enemy does, it doesn't matter how much satanic attack comes against the church, it will have a lot of attack, there will be a lot of pushback, there will be a lot of resistance. But even the very gates of hell cannot prevail against what I seek to do through my church because it is founded on the foundation, upon the rock of this revelation. I am God's chosen Messiah, and I am, I am his son. And then finally, as one of the last things that Jesus is is doing in his present day ministry, he's actually listening to our prayers. 
He's responding to our prayers and he's answering our prayers. Yeah, some of our prayers take a long time to get answered. You know, we understand that that's just the nature of where we're at. You know, we see in the biblical record, you know, for example, Abraham, from the moment he was promised that he would have a son that would be the line of Israel, until that son came was about 20, 25 years. So for many of us, we've carried many prayers throughout our life. Some prayers are answered, boom, quick. You know, just it's almost like they come the next minute. I mean, we've all had experiences like that. But the Lord always responds to our prayers. He always turns. Daniel was told that, Daniel, I've come in response to the moment, the very moment you began to pray, I was released. I was resisted, right? Daniel chapter 9. I was resisted by the prince of Persia, but I just want you to know that the moment you began to pray, heaven started to move. And my friends, we may not see the answer right away, but the moment we, we get down to pray and ask God and turn our hearts to God, He responds and He moves. And so He listens to our prayers, He responds to them, and He answers them. Well, the Lord bless you. We're going to just leave it there for now, but grace upon you. These are the different things that the Lord is doing right now as He sits at the right hand of the Father. The Lord bless you. Bye for now.